Penny and I were lying in bed reading as we did every night before bed. I, a hunting catalogue and my wife, now two years old, was reading a trashy love novel, the kind that featured an Adonis on the cover, bare-chested, his blonde mane fluttering in the wind while he clutched a barely clothed winch with huge heaving breasts, Penny broke the silence with a question that will ring in my ears forever, what would you do if you found out I was having an affair? I didn't say a word, I just reached over to my nightstand, pulled out my point thirty eight special, took the safety off, and put a hole right between my wife's eyes. The bullet actually tore through a glamorous 16 inches x 24 inches photograph she had given me for my birthday lab year. It left a nice hole in the wall behind her. The vinyl siding will need to be fixed too. Damn, that little gun was loud. Without protection, my ears were ringing. Penny, to put it politely soiled the sheets, when she calmed down enough to speak, she screamed are you crazy? What the hell did you do that for? she was still shaking. To answer your questions in order, first of all, no. I'm not crazy, and second, to show you what will happen if you ever cheat on me, only I'll shoot your pretty face, not your picture, but first, I'll make you watch me execute the cheating bastard who desecrated our marriage vows, you have my solemn word on the matter. Any other questions? Not a peep, we didn't press against each other that night. You'll never know. The next morning, I put the picture up again, broken glass and all, and the subject never came up again. Foolishly, I thought the reminder would be strong enough to guarantee fidelity fast forward five years. How I found out my wife was cheating was irrelevant. Suffice it to say that I knew for sure that at eleven in the morning, she would be fornicating with her boss, one Roger Lamphere 57 in our bed. When I arrived home at 11.10, my heart was pounding with joy because the driveway was empty, I prayed that my fact was wrong. However, I needed to get inside to make sure no one was home. Our house has a side entry garage and I was able to pull into the driveway without being seen from the master bedroom. When I opened the garage door, I almost threw up. Standing next to Penny's BMW was someone else's black Mercedes, I knew what I had to do. I took a deep breath and calmly loaded the 12-gauge pump shotgun with six high-velocity rounds. They were duck cartridges that spit out steel that shot more than a 100 feet into the air. I made a circle and slowly opened the door. On the floor of the Italian marble hallway lay a pile of discarded clothes that Penny just had to have. Fury boiled over when I saw my birthday present for her hanging from the banister, lace panties and bra that my wife had yet to wear for me. As I climbed the spiral staircase, I could hear them fucking like animals in our marital bed. No words, just guttural sounds like two lovers who can't speak. The door was open, and I could see Lamphere pounding my wife and his fat white ass jiggling with each thrust. I waited until he straightened up and then walked up behind him so Penny wouldn't see me. I wanted this to be a surprise badly, when he got a good rhythm going. I aimed the shotgun about six inches from the base of his skull and squeezed the trigger. Fire burst from the barrel and a 100-piece sized steel pellets pierced his head. I was amazed to see his body take two more jolts before collapse onto Penny. I guess it took his brain a while to tell his cock that he was going to spend eternity with the disgusting box of blue balls. Penny let out a single scream as the bright red blood and gray matter of his brain splattered all over her. Then she fell silent. She fainted. I had never killed anyone before, and I didn't know what to do. I really wanted to talk to Penny before I executed her so I rolled the dead bastard off her and onto the floor. The bullets had made a neat hole about an inch in diameter in his forehead. Until today. Every dead person I'd ever seen had been made up by an undertaker to look like they were asleep, no. Lamphere looked very dead, and he would not be buried in an open casket. He fell to the floor with a thud. And then I saw that his eyes were still wide open looking at me. I had to admit it made me nervous, so I pulled the blanket off the bed and threw it over the corpse. After a few minutes of waiting, I began to lose patience. I went to the bathroom poured a glass of cold water, and splashed Penny in the face, she sat up and shook her head. It looked like she was trying to figure out if this was all a bad dream, 
she realized it wasn't and was rewarded with a handful of Lam Fear's brains. I could see that she realized the reality of her predicament by the pure terror in her eyes. She tried to scream, but fear prevented the sounds from escaping. The only sound was her gulping for air with her mouth, like an asthmatic trying to draw breath. All too soon that was replaced by her banshee-like screams, I was beginning to worry that I wouldn't have the guts to shoot her. I mean, it's one thing to shoot a fat fuck in the back, but it's quite another to kill the woman I loved. I mean, I'm an accountant, not an assassin, you know I get mad when you cry. I'm telling you right now cut the crap. It won't help you one bit. I offered her a towel to wipe the brains and blood off her exposed breasts, she started to speak, but her lips were trembling so badly. I couldn't understand her, I told her to calm down and take a deep breath because I wanted to hear what she had to say, after a couple minutes, I could finally make it out. Am I going to die? Remember what I told you I would do if you had an affair? She nodded her head. Can you give me one good reason why I shouldn't kill you? She had the most bewildered expression on her face as if she was digging through the depth of her mind to find the marvelous words that would soften her death sentence. At last, she murmured. No, you've been my wife seven years, so I'll give you seven minutes to reconcile with God. I warn you if you try to talk me out of killing you. I'll blow your head off in an instant, I looked at my watch and said, time's up. Penny closed her eyes, and I assumed she was praying because I could see her lips moving, then she opened her eyes and moaned pitifully. Five minutes. I'm so sorry. I screwed up. Yeah, yeah. I I I. Shush shush four minutes. Penny stops talking. I wonder what I would do if I only had four minutes to live. I looked at my watch, three minutes. Matt, I'm so scared. Me too. Tears were rolling down my cheeks. Two minutes, is this gonna hurt a lot? Close your eyes. You'll open them in heaven. Penny started to sob louder, but finally managed to speak. Please shoot me in the chest, not in the face. I nodded and pointed the muzzle at her heart. Goodbye. The characteristic metallic sound of the bolt, clicking as it chambered a 12-gauge cartridge echoed through the room. I love you. I love you too. I pulled the trigger and ripped the life out of my wife. The shot made a hole in her chest the size of the hole she'd left in my heart. I sat down next to her lifeless body and cried for at least an hour. Then I took out a notebook and began to write my confession. I started by telling her about the hole in the painting and ended with I am a man of my word and I kept my promise to my wife. My stomach rumbled, and I realized that all I had eaten all day was a cup of coffee. If I call the police right now, I'll be lucky if I have time to eat something before tomorrow morning, I thought. And then inspiration struck. Pizza. I went downstairs and found the menu for the Italian restaurant next door that delivered food. I figured this would be the last pizza I'd ever have. I opened a bottle of beer, which would no doubt be my last, and wrote a note to my brother while I waited. I told him how to suppose of my property, bank account information, etc. I put Penny's insurance policy, all the cash I had on hand, and a bunch of keys in a priority mail envelope, sealed it, and then stuck the correct postage on it. Thirty minutes later, the doorbell rang. I handed the delivery guy 25 bucks and said, keep the change. I made his day. I wasn't sure if it was real or not, but I remembered that almost every detective show takes away the bad guy's belt and shoelaces to keep him from hanging himself. I knew there would be TV cameras in court and I didn't want to walk around like I was homeless. I took what I expected would be my last hot shower, then changed into a pair of comfortable pants that didn't need a belt and a pair of loafers. To make sure my story would get out, I made copies of my confession and mailed them to two reporters whose names I recognized from the front page of the local newspaper. I wanted to make sure everyone knew why I had to do this. I walked about a half mile to the drug store and dropped the envelopes in the mailbox. As I walked back, I realized I was taking my last walk as a free man. Ten minutes later, 
I took one last walk through our house ending in the master bedroom. I kissed Penny goodbye one last time and went downstairs to call the police. I placed my signed confession on the floor next to the disassembled shotgun. 911. What is your emergency? My name is Matthew Weiss. I just shot my wife and her lover. I have your address, 2201 Morrison Street. Yes, ma'am. They're in the bedroom upstairs. I'm sending a squad car and an ambulance. I've alerted the officers that you're armed. Please state your intent. No problem, ma'am. Tell the officers I will offer no resistance. The front door is wide open, and I'll be lying face down with my fingers behind my head. A couple minutes later, the first patrol car arrived. It took them almost as long to get in and handcuff me. I was taken to the station in the back of an unmarked car. The next couple days passed like a blur. I was glad I ate before turning myself in as I was interrogated non-stop. I should mention I live in a nice quiet bedroom neighborhood, and this was the first double homicide they had ever had. It seemed like everyone wanted to talk to me. I kept telling them that I explained everything in my confession, but they still insisted on questioning me. The detective questioning me kept asking if I had ever thought about suicide. My answer was always the same. I only did what I gave my solemn word, and a man who does not keep his word is not a man. He got even angrier when I refused to tell him how I knew my wife was having an affair and more specifically, when she was having a date with her lover. His fancy words didn't loosen my tongue because I was sworn to secrecy, and I am, after all, a man of my word. I couldn't tell how much time had passed because there was no window or clock in the room, just a metal table to which I was handcuffed in two chairs. Later, when it was early evening, as I assumed it was, a state police investigator took over the interrogation. He seemed like a nice enough guy he even offered me a cup of coffee. It tasted like hell. I told my story again. He thanked me for my time and said he'd be back when it was time for me to go to court. I was then examined by a psychiatrist to determine if I had lost my mind. When he asked if I felt remorse, I said, no. I feel betrayed. I was betrayed by a woman who promised before God and men to leave everyone else behind. Then I added, I had to do what I did. Otherwise, I would not be a man. He was not very pleased with my answers. We argued at length about my morals and ethics for what must have been two hours before he announced that he had what he needed. I was shackled and taken back to my cell to wait for the next inquisitor. The next morning I was brought before a judge for arraignment. After the indictment was read, I was asked if I would plead guilty. Guilty, your honor, my court-appointed attorney who looked like he was straight out of law school shouted, No, your honor. My client did not do that. I mean, it was a crime of passion, and I'm claiming temporary insanity on his part. I objected just as vigorously that I was not crazy and I knew what I was doing. I shouted, Your Honor, may I please speak? There was a loud roar from the audience cries of let the murderer speak, rang out. Others suggested how to put me to death. One man in a bad suit pushed his way forward, Thompson of the Times. I got your confession in the mail, Mr. Weiss. Is it accurate? I replied, yes, my confession is real, and a couple of burly sheriff's deputies pushed me out of the courtroom. I never heard back from the judge, I spent another fine evening at the Gray Bar Hotel complete with room service food, after eating a dinner of a sausage sandwich, potato chips, and green beans, I sat on my bunk and stared at the wall until the lights went out. That night, the worst thing happened. Matthew Weiss woke up, but he couldn't move. He thought he was having a conscious dream that he couldn't wake up from. He began to panic he felt his pillow soaked with sweat while the rest of his body was cold. He tried to call out, but he couldn't. The only thing he could do was blink. When the jailer came in the morning to count the prisoners, he ordered Weiss to get out of bed. When he didn't, he called for reinforcements before unlocking the cell. It didn't take them long to realize he wasn't faking it. Matthew Weiss was paralyzed after suffering a stroke. Paramedics showed up and carried him to an ambulance. He was taken to county hospital with his right wrist handcuffed to a gurney. The next thing he knew, 
he was lying in bed with a web of wires and tubes connected to him. He overheard someone explaining that he had suffered a massive stroke, but it looked like he would live. Six months later, he could move his left arm enough to feed himself. He didn't say anything else. The county doesn't spend a lot of money on physical rehabilitation for admitted murderers, so Matthew Weiss spent the rest of his life sitting in a wheelchair and staring at the wall. Occasionally, the minimum wage in turn would turn on the TV. It didn't matter because he lived in his mind reliving his marriage fast-forwarding through the bad times and dwelling on the good. He also had a great philosophical debate about his final judgment. He was convinced he would be reunited with his wife. Ten years later, the angel of death took Matthew Weiss's soul. He died with a smile on his face. When the reporter called to tell Mrs. Lamphier that her husband's killer was dead, she smiled too. She smiled because her secret died with him. No one will ever know that she was the one who made the phone call that made Matthew prove he was a man of his word.